Welcome to Beyond the Headlines. I'm Spiro Rondos for Concordia University. I would like to welcome Frank Chalk, Professor of History and Director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies at Concordia, one of the world's foremost scholars on genocide and humanitarian intervention. Frank Chalk has co-authored The History and Sociology of Genocide, now considered a standard work in the field, as well as many other books, book chapters, and scholarly articles. Frank Chalk has a PhD from the University of Wisconsin, has been a Fulbright professor in Nigeria, and a fellow of the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies in Washington. He recently co-authored Mobilizing the Will to Intervene. That book proposes specific, concrete recommendations to US and Canadian leaders for preventing future mass atrocities. Two of his recommendations have been adopted by the Obama administration in the United States. In conversation with Frank Chalk is Major Chris Young of the Canadian Army. Major Young served two tours of duty in Croatia and Bosnia during the turbulent events of the 1990s as Factions and Contingent Operations Officer. We'll have to ask you what that means later on. He has also served in Afghanistan and spent five years as Canadian Forces Liaison Officer in Fort Knox, Kentucky, monitoring U.S. Army development in armor. Chris Young has been decorated by the U.S. Army, NATO, the UN, and the Canadian Forces. He has an MA in Strategic Studies from the Royal Military College of Canada. He is currently a PhD student at Concordia, working on conflict studies and international relations. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Professor Chalk, you've said that every form of deviance has been studied except the one that's killed the greatest number of people. Can you expand on that and uh, talk a little bit about your research? Indeed. Uh, back in the late 1970s, uh, historians and sociologists paid very little attention to the history and sociology of genocide. And in sociology in particular, the study of deviance was a really big and growing field. Uh, my colleague Kurt Jonasson from sociology, who first proposed that I work on genocide, uh, said to me, my colleagues have time to study every kind of deviance except the one that kills the most people. And it's one of those statements you hear and you know instantly it's correct. So uh, he asked if I knew of any historians who might be interested and uh, I said, yeah, me. Uh, I think he was a bit surprised. Uh, and we went on then to lay out the boundaries of a field in history and sociology that would seek to understand, first of all, why genocide had been committed from the earliest days of uh, human civilization up to the present. Uh, many people made the mistake of believing that the Holocaust was the first genocide in history, when in fact there had been earlier genocides in the 20th century, and there had been genocides as early as what we call biblical times uh, in the uh, Fertile Crescent, etc., perpetrated uh, by the ancient Assyrians, Babylonians, and others. So we wanted to know why does this happen? And then as we began to work on that subject, we also wanted to know what can we do to prevent it in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, Christian, can you uh, tell us a little bit about your perspective on uh, some of these issues? Well, I think that my interest in this particular area came about uh, from my two tours in, in Bosnia in 93-94, uh, serving with the United Nations. I got very interested in the um, a lot of the atrocities that were taking place, why they were taking place, some of the supposed age-old hatreds that were, were manifesting themselves in that particular area of the, uh, the world. And uh, in my um, uh, graduate studies, I started looking into how the UN was supposed to be functioning versus how it was actually functioning, and started contrasting that with some of the effectiveness you saw with NATO and a few other regional organizations. And that led to my interest in, in, in uh, uh, PhD and working with uh, Professor Chalk, studying under him, uh, the genocide in particular, but also looking at uh, military interventions and uh, how one decides um, how, you, how you determine success, what constitutes success in a military intervention, how you tie a military intervention into the, the whole of government approach, bringing the diplomatic side of the house in, bringing the development side of the house in, which goes directly to, I think, uh, the will to intercede project, because that's one of the fundamental precepts that they've come out with, this whole idea of linking all three uh, lines of operation, if you will. 
and coming up with uh, a coherent package that moves into a particular country, is able to operate in that country, prevent the mass atrocity, stop the genocide if it's in the making, and then withdraw, leaving a safe and secure environment. You're talking about metrics, and you're talking about policies or the policy... Um, and Chris and I converge. <laughs> we, we, can, we converge at the point of uh, creating new knowledge mm -hmm. about how better to measure success, which is particularly his interest and one of the reasons I was so enthusiastic about working with him. And uh, also then, uh, if you do stop it, and that's not the hard part, what do you do next, which is the really tough part? Exactly. You're saying, um, well, you know, we've had we've had um, uh, statements like uh, "never again" and "we'll never forget" and so forth. But you're talking about having some kind of coherent package of of, of actions or steps to prevent something happening again, or prevent it from happening, and uh, I guess mitigating its mm -hmm. its effects. The, the first thing we learned is that we don't know a lot. <laughs> That's a lot that we have to study and research and think about. Second thing we learned is that every situation is different. So, and that's a very important lesson. So that we really have to fine tune whatever solutions we propose. And this means working with anthropologists, sociologists, political scientists, geographers, people in, even in the natural and physical sciences about what are the possibilities in different societies, different cultures, uh, and of course they need historians too. Uh, one of our jobs as historians is to help them build a shared history, uh, a history not necessarily that they all agree on, but a history that accurately traces their narratives and eliminates a lot of the myths as we go so that in the end we have a core of knowledge that is pretty well filtered so that the garbage is out the ideological stuff is pushed to the side. Nationalism is what you're talking about, right? Well, there. Uh, certain kinds of nationalism. I mean, you know, look, uh, here in Canada, we're nationalists, aren't we? We believe in right. hockey. It's the romance <laughs> that uh, is objectionable sometimes. Peace, order, hockey. and good government. <laughs> <Yeah>. Hockey. <laughs> sure. Uh, the uh, true north. And a lot of other stuff. That, that's part, you know, I originally came from the United States to Canada. I've learned all that stuff. So now I'm a Canadian nationalist, but I'm not an extreme nationalist. Right. And it's the extreme nationalism that's so problematic and that Chris referred to. It's the nationalism that says uh, there's only one identity, this is it, and because you don't fit that template, you're out of here. Yeah. And then we get the ethnic cleansings, we get the crimes against humanity that go with the ethnic cleansings, and sometimes we get genocide and serious war crimes as a result. But the, the main thing that we have to learn is and this is really difficult. Uh, as long as people like myself are offering prescriptions and people like Chris are serving with the forces when we do some of these things to stop and then rebuild with the local people, we have to learn which local people to work with, how to share authority with them, and which aspects of their culture and their political system uh, are safe to reify, safe to reinforce for the future. They know a lot more than we do about their history, their culture, and their outlook. So we have to assimilate all of that, but, but they also need us very often to help them to find the way to the future because they have so much baggage. And we don't have the same baggage, we have different baggage. Right. Uh, you must have seen facets of that kind of tribalism that uh, Professor Chalk was talking oh, about in Bosnia, I would think. Definitely. I, mean, I can contrast uh, the two tours that I served. When I served in 93-94, um, my <clears throat> pre-deployment training was predominantly with military personnel. Uh, there, were no civilian, there was no civilian interaction. We had nothing to do with DFATE. We had nothing to do with CEDA. Uh, we had nothing to do with any other government department. We had nothing to do with any of the NGOs, uh, international or Canadian. In, in when you deployed over into the into the region, uh, similar things. I mean, the embassy uh, or the the consulate at the time in Zagreb did its own thing. We in the contingent headquarters are, did our own thing, and every once in a while we met, you know, and things meshed together. But that was the exception as opposed to the rule. In ninety six ninety seven, when I deployed back again as part of the NATO uh, stabilization force S four, there was a much closer linkage. Uh, I remember the contingent commander. Uh, now General uh, Grant, he's out uh, 
uh, he had regular contact with diplomatic officials. Not perfect, but we, we did talk to them. We also talked more and more to the NGOs. We'd convinced a lot of the NGOs that were working with in our area that it was to their advantage to liaise with us, and at least we did some synchronization. We had daily ops, uh, daily ops uh, briefings uh, in which we brought some of the key personnel in. We talked to the policing uh, elements that were over there, the RCMP who were doing uh, training of, of the uh, local police. We talked to the uh, civilian police um, liaisons who were there. That sort of thing started to emerge from the Bosnia experience. You started to see that. When we went into Afghanistan, when you look at what the troops are going in, doing in Afghanistan, you have this concept of the provincial reconstruction teams, which, the, I mean, the Americans like to claim credit for it, but I think a lot of it, you can trace back its origins come out of Bosnia. Interesting. Lessons learned from Bosnia, some of the uh, work that we did together in Bosnia, you bring that forward into Afghanistan, you solidify it in these provincial reconstruction teams, which now are military, the development, and the diplomats. I mean, we had, uh, I can't remember his name now, we had a diplomat her killed very early on in one of the missions. I mean, he was out on the front lines with the troops. No longer can you make that distinction and say, you know, the, the diplomats are back in the embassy or the consulate or whatever. They're out on the front on the front lines. It's it's a very different situation nowadays. It came directly out of, out of Bosnia. I, I believe it did. I mean, no one's, you don't have that linkage, but I mean, if you, mm -hmm. if you look back and you look at the experience, the Bosnian experience, you can see what's been pulled out of there. I mean, the Americans, uh, the U.S. Army likes to um, uh, identify it as coming out of Iraq, but I think that there's a lot of lessons that came out of Bosnia, um, particularly when you look at the, Ameri the American Army and the special operations uh, forces that were involved in a lot of these peacekeeping missions. A lot of the lessons that those people uh, took on board in terms of working with NGOs, working with other government departments, a lot of that manifests itself in, in uh in Iraq, and I think a lot of the, the doers and, and the movers and shakers are these guys who were involved in mm -hmm. early peacekeeping operations. I wonder how many of these lessons are, are transposable. You, you took these lessons from Bosnia, applied them to Afghanistan, a very different society, mm -hmm. very different society, and in the will to intervene, you're, you have these, you're very local. I mean, you talk only about the United States and Canada, because I suppose it's That's what we know best. We right start now. with the countries we know best, right. and now we're going to go on to South Africa and Britain. And how do you work with teams in those countries. Mm -hmm. uh, the key, wherever you work, is to understand the society you're working in. So if it's Canada and the U.S., you darn well better understand the political culture. You better understand uh, the direction the society is moving in, how values are changing, uh, what sort of perceptions are and buzzwords are driving the media in that country, et cetera, and what people are uh, afraid of, what they're insecure about. People uh, in every country have anxieties, and it's uh, these anxieties that the killers and the provocateurs work on. You not only need to understand the anxieties, you also need to understand the authority structure of the society you're working in. Uh, in Canada and the U.S., it's different. The political system is different. Uh, in Bosnia and Afghanistan and Iraq and all those places, it's different. Uh, you need to know in many countries where uh, prime minister's offices and legislatures at the national level are really not that important, what the local authority structure is. So in many of the countries we've been talking about, it's the elders, it's the village council, uh, it's the religious authorities. Uh, these are the people who really wield influence, uh, which is a synonym for authority here. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to build relationships with them. And you, you, you can't do it on the basis of the wrong values. In other words, if you have a fanatic village uh, leader uh, who wants to get rid of uh, all the minority people in the village, well, that's not the person you want to build the bridges to. That's pretty obvious. But when you think of how naive we were and how ill-informed we were, before we went into places like Iraq and Afghanistan. It's astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing. And I don't think this was the military's fault. I think this was really our political leadership, which was as naive and also, in a sense, as arrogant, arrogant. as you could be. So the charges uh, that arose at the time of Kosovo and Bosnia and Afghanistan and Iraq of neo-imperialism, neo-colonialism, are false. I don't think that's what was happening. But what is true 
is we acted as if we were the arrogant uh, colonialists or imperialists uh, out of uh, some kind of conviction that because we were sure we were right in those cases that therefore we could do no wrong. So what was really relevant was the Hippocratic Oath, the medical oath, above all, do no harm. We did mm. a lot of harm, and not just in civilian casualties, but also in distorting those societies. Now we've learned some lessons, uh, and those lessons require us in the future to be much more nuanced, much more sophisticated, much more careful, much more respectful of the local cultures. We cannot have a system in which a platoon punishes the member who does worst on some proficiency uh, or skill exam by forcing that individual, ordering that individual, to run around the perimeter wearing the clothing traditionally worn by male peasants in that society. Because the male peasants see that. They recognize a punishment when it's in front of their face. And they recognize that wearing their clothes is considered humiliating. Well, you know, how are they going to react then to the presence of that platoon the day after? Are they going to tell you about the uh, improvised uh, explosive device down the road? Are they going to feel you respect them? No way. But you know, to, now when you say it, it's obvious. But it wasn't so obvious at the beginning. Interesting. Is that kind of training uh, inculcated in the, in, in the military? Uh, the, the ground level grassroots training about respect and... Uh... I can only talk about my experience. But I mean, cultural awareness training before we went into Bosnia uh, was relatively circumspect. Um, as an officer, I was I was going above and beyond by going out and reading a lot of material that was available. Uh, Misha Glenny's books on on uh, on Bosnia was a great help. I mean, it was a it was a more of a cultural tour guide, if you will, but it outlines some of the the faux pas you can run into in a particular uh, in a, in that particular society. More and more, what we're doing is we start to bring in. Um, expatriate Afghans or expatriate Bosnians or whatever country we're going into and we start bringing those people earlier into the training process. There is a certain amount of, 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 uh, of cultural problems though because you have this cultural superiority that we have in the West and you see that throughout. I mean the idea that that um, the Canadian forces is representative of Canadian society is quite true and you will see that same sort of uh, cultural superiority that's echoed within a Western society echoed within its military. We try to train it out. Are we successful all the time? Not always, but I think that by and large, um, if you look at the quality of the soldier that we have on the ground, their understanding of, of, of cultural nuances in a lot of cases, it's, it's fairly good. You, you know, you, you run into the, 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 the situation where you have this, you know, a platoon that thinks that they have a good idea and they go and implement something and then they're shown to be culturally insensitive. Um, hopefully that platoon was corrected. I don't know. <laughs> I'm assuming it was. I mean, it made it made the news. So when it I'm, made the Wall Street Journal, yeah, exactly, I assume sure. it was corrected. So I'm, I'm assuming it was. It was a Wall Street but... Journal reporter who observed this. Yeah. Which country did this happen in? It was an American platoon operating in a very dangerous area in Afghanistan. Uh, that was visited by a reporter from the Wall Street Journal who included this anecdote in his book and also in one of his news stories. I guess the entire, the entire world is listening. I mean, with, with technology Darn right being they're listening. Is, is a cell phone. <laughs> well, no, no, but this goes back serious to, business. This goes back to a U.S. Marine General um, Krulik who came up with the idea of the strategic corporal. I mean, the three-block war, which is uh, the Canadian forces have sort of transposed into this idea of the full spectrum of operations being deploying and being ready and capable of doing everything from peace support operations through to full intensity combat. But he came up with this concept of the strategic corporal. What your corporal does on the ground can have strategic impact back at home, around the world, wherever. As you've seen, you know, you've got a, a, a misguided sergeant in, who's running a platoon who decides that this is a, an effective way of disciplining his people, who doesn't realize the impact of what he's doing is now going to be seen with a worldwide audience. You know, that's the effect of the strategic corporal. That's what Krulik's uh, brilliance was, was talking about. Hmm. Professor Chuck, the Will to Intervene report uh, makes two recommendations that, well, makes many recommendations, but two were adopted by the Obama administration, which is mm -hmm. quite a coup. <clears throat> why has or why has the Canadian government failed or not followed suit? The Obama administration is 
almost unique on the face of the earth at the moment. Samantha Power uh, sits on the National Security Council of the United States. She is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of A Problem from Hell, which is the first book to seriously look at U.S. foreign policy in cases of genocide. So to have Samantha Power uh, at the elbow of the president is very special. Uh, when we were in Washington last April, uh, General Dallaire spent three hours at the White House talking with her, uh, and, and they were joined by David Pressman, who is the point person of the National Security Council and of the administration in implementing the recommendations that were made by two groups, our group and also an American group, which brought in the Cohn Albright report, uh, which made very, very similar recommendations to ours. So uh, uh, David Pressman in that conversation expressed great enthusiasm for our recommendations and actually uh, proposed especially that our emphasis on the interest that governments in countries like Canada and the U.S. and also even in Africa and other parts of the world, the self-interest of those governments in implementing our recommendations offers a unique and very, very important approach that nobody else has taken. Uh, the traditional approach when we spoke about preventing mass atrocities was to emphasize the moral, ethical, and humanitarian facets of the reasoning behind intervention. Uh, I looked at that and I remembered April 1994. I remembered that nobody listened in governments and I remembered why they didn't listen. Uh, I remembered that the backlash uh, of the Somalia intervention here in Canada and in the United States was so strong that politicians became allergic to what we called humanitarian intervention because it bit them. They didn't want to be bitten like that before the next election again in 1994. Consequently, I began to ask myself the obvious question. Is there any other reason, a good reason, why politicians should be motivated to support intelligent, prudent intervention, not just any intervention? And the answers became evident as we did the research. Uh, and the answers are really uh, very important. And this is what David Pressman recognizes. This is what the Obama administration recognizes. It's what the U.S. military has finally, uh, I shouldn't say finally, has pioneered recognizing, together with some of the people in the Canadian forces and the British and some other countries. And the basic reasons you intervene uh, in your own interest are to protect yourself from terrorism, from piracy, from economic exploitation by warlords, from the pandemic lethal diseases that arise when we neglect parts of the world in which toxic infections are rife and we are not able to uh, implement public health measures to inoculate and vaccinate and to monitor the way we're supposed to. And also uh, you intervene uh, in your own interest to prevent huge outflows of populations that are displaced by these mass atrocities as part of these mass atrocities who have no choice but to flee and who then threaten the labor market in many adjacent countries uh, inadvertently create a high level of xenophobia and general hostility of foreigners as they occupy jobs that local, po local people believe they're entitled to, also impact the local culture and uh, raise the level of urban density or in other ways impact on the social conditions all over those countries. If you look at South Africa today, this huge impor uh, importing of displaced people uh, as a result of Robert Mugabe's atrocities in Zimbabwe, you see an incredible level, an incredible increase of xenophobia. And it's leading to murders. It's leading to social disorders. It's actually a threat to the government of South Africa and its district and regional offices in some areas. And they're just beginning to wrestle with it. So we don't really have a difficult time proving that it's in the interest of our political leaders to act. I think the problem is that right now the economy is very tough, so they're trying to save money by cutting military budgets. They're trying to cut down the number of troops. They're trying to cut down equipment acquisition. 
And we're asking them to do something they've never done before, that we've just learned to do properly. We're asking them to protect civilians. That isn't what they were all about. They were only seeking to protect civilians indirectly in the past. Since the 90s, we've been asking them to go in and not fight traditional uh, tank battles and artillery battles. We're asking them instead to go in with minimum collateral damage of civilians and to operate in such a way that the local population is protected very effectively and even at the sacrifice of some of our own troops. In other words, and General Petraeus has said this and others have said this, we have to take short-term casualties in order to win these wars. And they're not traditional wars at all. They're wars of civilian protection and really helping the local people to rebuild their society so they will never again be as vulnerable to those who propose mass atrocities. How does that compare, uh, Chris Young, with the uh, Canadian history of peacekeeping? Uh, well, I, I think Professor Chalk has summed it up quite nicely. Well, part of the problem is that in the past, we've been involved in peace support operations from the perspective of a very generic separation of two uh, warring factions and then uh, trying to provide the diplomatic side of the house with enough time to come to a solution. Um, that hasn't always been successful. I mean, for example, you can look at Cyprus. How many years have we been in Cyprus now? We still, there's still a uh, UN presence in Cyprus. There is still a, a UN presence in the Middle East. Um, these are all areas where diplomatic negotiations are ongoing. You still require the traditional peace support operation that's on the ground, keeps the two sides apart. That's going to happen. The, I think what is different now and this is part of what the Americans are starting to recognize, is that we're now moving into this era of nation building. If you want a sustainable peace, if you want a secure and uh, stable environment in a particular country so that democracy and democratic values can flourish, you need to be in a position where you're providing the country with advice and guidance on how to build that nation. All of the institutions, you know, everything from security sector reform to banking reform, to putting in checks and balances so that you know you're the head of your government doesn't abscond with all of the milit or all of the aid that's coming in. You know these are all these are all the things that we're starting to get involved in. Um, this is one of the things. If you go back to I, I believe it was the uh, acts were the um, foreign. Um, a policy that we came up with in Canada, this idea of the whole of government approach, where you link in the three, uh, three lines of operation. You've got the governance you've, uh, through the uh, through the development. You've got uh, the diplomatic, and you've got the military providing that secure, stable security environment, so that the other two lines can flourish. If uh, you start getting into that, it starts involving thinking outside of the box, you start moving away from what we've traditionally done, you start moving into the area of uh, what we call stability operations, you start looking at uh, things like protecting uh, minorities within a particular society, you start looking at things like, um, for example, the impact of, of dismantling an entire security apparatus, say as you did in Iraq. What are the immediate up implications afterwards? In every instance when you've got a transition going on, you see a sudden rise in the number of rapes that take place in that particular country. 90% of those rapes are against women, a number of them are against, you know, small children and, 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 and boys and the like. But how do you, you know, these are the types of things that you have to come to grips with. If you're going to try to change a society, then you have to have a long-term goal, you have to have a long-term understanding of what it is you're undertaking. This is why, I mean, when you look at Afghanistan, um, the, the Canadian public rightly sort of sits there and goes, why are we there? What are we doing? Because it hasn't been sold properly, in my opinion. We haven't said what the long-term goal is in Afghanistan, what it is we're trying to do, how we're going to get there. We haven't articulated that vision to the Canadian public. All they see is military force on the ground, military force on the ground is doing what it traditionally does, it's going out, it's uh, search and destroy. You're not seeing the, on a regular basis, you're not seeing the, the behavior of the provincial reconstruction team, a lot of the nation building exercises that they're doing. You haven't had the nation building part of the operation properly articulated by our, our leadership, my opinion again, and, and that creates the problems. I think leadership is the key word. Exactly. Leadership is the key word. Uh, the argument we're making is 
that a wise and far-sighted leader <coughs> will understand that it's important to consider the long-term interest of the people of his or her country. And that interest depends, among other things, on preventing mass atrocities that are preventable. They're not all preventable, but many of them are. So in countries where they can be prevented with the tools we have available, it's really in our long-term interest to prevent them. Now, the, the traditional average, and I'll even say mediocre, political leader says, who's really a caretaker, basically is a victim of events and circumstances, and says, in the long run, we're all dead. So I don't care about the long run. I care about the next election. Okay, next election is important, but it's not everything. My prediction is that when we have one of the disasters we could have prevented, the party in power is going to pay, whichever country it's in. People will wake up to the fact that these were preventable disasters. And they will say, why didn't we do something in the Democratic Republic of Congo? Why didn't we do something in Afghanistan, etc.? which would have saved us from this disaster. And I'm talking about Titanic stuff. I'm talking about pandemics now. I'm talking about major acts of terror, et cetera. The politicians look at Bill Clinton in 94 and in the election of, 90, of November 94, and they say, Clinton paid no price. But of course, the fact is the Rwandan uh, genocide, in which he actually prevented intervention by the United States, only came back to haunt us several years later when all of Central Africa fell apart and when the price of coltan began to spiral upwards. And we haven't seen the end of it yet. We're still paying that price. Uh, the, the Germans are now looking at an E. coli outbreak. And the form of mutant bacteria that they're fighting in Germany right now was seen in only two places on the face of the earth before it erupted in Germany. One of them was the Central African Republic. We need to know more about those circumstances. But I was not surprised at all, because we live in an age of air travel, and the global village is upon us. I travel a lot. You travel a lot. Chris travels a lot. We go all over the world. We come home, and whatever we have here in Canada, I take with me as far away as Kyrgyzstan or Cambodia or Uganda. The commercial travelers do the same. And when I come home, I bring back whatever they have out there. We don't go into quarantine. We are not isolated on an Ellis Island for a week when we arrive because we don't do that anymore. But in fact, if we don't do that, then we have to do everything possible to boost the level of public health in these other places, and that means combating the eruption of these mass atrocities. It means aid, economic aid, that's intelligently administered by us and by them, and it also means uh, diplomacy and mediation and conflict resolution, as well as the deployment of military force if and when it's required. Well, we talked, about, we touched on at least uh, arrogance a little bit earlier, uh, propensity of Western uh, governments and of Western people to be arrogant. What about the issue of national sovereignty? I know you attended, yeah. I think, a uh, conference recently yeah, about, yeah, on Munster, that issue. Yeah, Germany, the yeah. first humanitarian uh, conference of the city of Münster. Uh, and this was one of their big questions. Uh, and General Dallaire and I addressed uh, the conference with our answers. Because Münster is the city in which the peace of Westphalia was negotiated. And Osnabrück and Münster are the cities in which it was signed uh, up there in northern Germany. So the concept of national sovereignty, which emerged from the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, that's a long time ago, has driven uh, a lot of our understanding of international relations since then. And here we come along uh, with the responsibility to protect concept that originates in Canada in the late 90s and early 21st century and is adopted by the United Nations and now is mentioned in two Security Council resolutions on Ivory Coast and on Libya. Uh, and we say, wait a minute, we believe in the Charter of the United Nations, which is designed to protect the national sovereignty of all member states. But there's a corollary to this, and the corollary is simple. Your national sovereignty must be respected 
so long as you do not commit mass atrocities against the people in your country. Your government doesn't shoot them down in cold blood, does not mow them down with machine guns and run them over with tanks and, sh and destroy their uh, villages, towns, and cities with heavy artillery and poison gas. If you do that, uh, you get one more chance. This is the second pillar. The first is national sovereignty of responsibility protect. You get another chance. The UN will come in and offer assistance to help you behave differently without the military. Simply technical assistance, foreign assistance, aid, money, technical advice. So you don't have to do those things if you're willing to reconsider. But if you're not willing to reconsider, we go to pillar three, and that is effective and definitive intervention. So you're out of there. You have lost the protection of national sovereignty. You cannot, under the cloak Forfeit. of national sovereignty, do these things to your people anymore if we uh, can intervene without triggering a nuclear war. You're both historians. If I can uh, conclude with one uh, rather obvious question, do we learn from the past? I'll start with you. I would have to say yes. I mean, I think that when you look at the linkage between, I, I go to my own experience when I when I saw what we did in ninety three, ninety four, when I saw again what we did in Bosnia in ninety six, ninety seven, and then uh, going into Afghanistan in in o three to uh, do fact finding lessons, collecting lessons at that particular time. I think I was able to see. In Bosnia in particular, I was able to see learning taking place. Uh, my second tour was much more rewarding. I think that we had a much better uh, understanding of what we were doing. We were much more in tuned, if you will, with the nation building side of the house, the stability operations. We didn't call it that at the time, but we were starting to see a lot more of that. Um, and Afghanistan, it just, in my opinion, is just going the next step. When you look at the lessons that are coming out from the provincial reconstruction teams, when you look at the uh, strategic um, teams that are working, strategic advisory teams that are working with the national leadership in Afghanistan to educate them on, on the responsibilities of leaders, uh, educate them on, on the responsibilities of ministers and the like, accountability, checks and balances, that sort of thing, I think it's starting to come. Uh, yes, I, I believe that we are seeing uh, uh, an educative process. I think that we are, at least in 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 uh, NATO, if you will, within the NATO realm. I think that we're learning organization. We have learning. We have we have armies or militaries that are are starting to learn what they should be doing. It's not perfect, obviously, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of room for improvement. But I think it's starting to come. Yeah, and Concordia's will to intervene project mm -hmm. is based on the premise that historians and other scholars can inform public policy, help political leaders exercise leadership by learning from the past and applying what has been learned from the past. In our case, our immediate inspiration was General Dallaire and his experience as UN Force Commander in Rwanda. And learning from that experience has been extremely important. So our inspiration was to learn from the past, not to wreak vengeance against the politicians who sat on their hands and worse, but rather to help them to learn from that tragedy so that those half a million or 800,000 deaths would not be in vain. If I could make one more observation sure. too, I think too, from a military point of view, it's been a relatively close circle of society, if you will. And I think with the emergence of, of people like General Petraeus, uh, Colonel McFarland, and others who've gone out there and produced books while in uniform. I mean, if you look at General Petraeus and the whole counterinsurgency manual, the process by which he farmed it out into the civilian community, into the academic community, into government, soliciting advice on what should be put in there and listening to that advice, that to me is, is in some ways revolutionary. That's, that's the movement towards a learning organization. When you start soliciting outside, you start getting outside the box in terms of who you're talking to. You start talking to other expertise, you start bringing that expertise in, and then you start incorporating it into your manuals. That's when you start seeing learning take place. When you think about Donald Rumsfeld's decision to support the demobilization of the army of Iraq after the defeat of that army, his model was the defeat of Germany at the end of World War II. <laughs> He thought he was choosing a model from history. But he didn't talk to anybody who really knew Iraq about what the impact of demobilizing the army would be. Uh, 
you can make a lot of mistakes if you think you're learning from history and you choose the wrong lessons. R wrong time. Our job wrong is battle. to help people choose the right lessons yeah. and to find the right lessons and help them to apply them. Okay. Frank Chuck, Christopher Young, thank you. Mm -hmm.